Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this video is for Lifespan Development, and in it we're looking at the second online quiz for Chapter 4 on Early Childhood. The first question in this quiz is, six-year-old Pippa has difficulty controlling her bladder and has accidents at least twice per month. Pippa suffers from what? A. Aneurysis, B. Proteinuria, C. Encapresis, or D. Dyspepsia? Well, the uh, choice here is enuresis. Now, all of these are legitimate problems. Let me just define each one. Enuresis is the repeated inability to control urination. You, you can see that you got the ur in there. Uh, proteinuria is the presence of an excess of serum proteins in the urine. That's a different issue. Encapresis is voluntary or involuntary fecal soiling, so uh, bowel control, uh, pooping in your pants. And then dyspepsia is impaired digestion or indigestion. So dyspepsia and indigestion are the same thing. Anyhow, but the one we're talking about right here is enuresis. And by the way, enuresis and necapresis basically assume that the child is old enough to have developed bowel or uh, bladder control already. Okay, second one. Lee picks her three-year-old son, Min, up from daycare and asks, what did you do today? Min shouts back, you know, mommy, stop asking. According to Piaget, Min is demonstrating what? A. Egocentrism, B. Narcissism, C. Apathy, or D. Individualism. Well, uh, those are all four things that people can display. Um, the one in this case is egocentrism. Now, again, uh, we talked about this in the last quiz. We're not talking about the vain, self-absorbed kind of egocentrism. But this, in, for Piaget, it means the inability to take the physical viewpoint of other people. And we saw this one before. He used the three mountains task and saw that if a child was sitting um, on the left side, you see here where they have the, uh, the, the air mountain on the left, the cylinder in the middle, the cross on the right. They're not able to see that if you were sitting on a different side of the table, those would be in a different arrangement. Anyhow, that's egocentrism. Question number three. When Brian watches his father pour two cups of water into a wide saucepan and two cups of water into a, a tall pot, so the same amount of water, Brian fixates on the height of the tall pot and believes that it contains more water. Brian's fixation on the height of the pot illustrates what? A. Transference. B. Inclusion. C. Conservation. Or D. Centration. But again, all legitimate terms, but the one we're looking for right here, because he's focusing on one dimension exclusively, is we're looking for centration. So centering or fixating on a single dimension of what's really a multi-dimensional problem all at once. Here's our little picture here, the kid where you're taking the two cups of water, you pour one of them into a tall one, and they say, well, it's taller, therefore it has more. Now, it's also possible that the kid could say that the shorter one has more because it's wider, just pick a dimension and run with it. But the point is, they're only focusing on one. And the ability to decenter or decentration, which comes later, is the point at which the children are able to see that even though the shape has changed, the overall amount is the same. Okay, question number four. The memory of specific episodes or events is referred to as blank memory. What kind of memory? A, ingrained, B, working, C, concrete, or D, autobiographical? Well, in this case, the answer is D, autobiographical. Now, I would argue that there's, there could be more than one answer for this one, but of those four choices that are offered, it's definitely autobiographical. You may recall this picture from the uh, book or the, the presentations. This is a kid standing at a memorial for uh, victims of the, hur of the Hurricane Katrina. Um, and that it is such an extraordinarily huge episode in people's lives that they can de it becomes part of who they are, defines it, and they remember where they were, what they were doing. It becomes part of that person's life, part of their own autobiography. All right, number five. The motto of the authoritative parent is likely to be what? Because I say so. Parents have rules because they care. Be free, be yourself, or children should not be seen nor heard. You may recall that we had these choices in an earlier question. Well, the earlier question, by the way, was about the authoritarian parent. This one is about authoritative. Very similar words, but very different meanings. In this case, the answer is parents have rules because they care. And again, let's take a look at our, our little chart here. 
Having rules means that you actually have high restrictiveness and control. You have rules, you have expectations or boundaries. So it's going to be on the right side of this, it's going to be either authoritarian or authoritative. What distinguishes between the two is the uh, dimension on the left. Or is it warmth and responsiveness? If it's low because they don't care about the kid, that's the iron fist, do it my way, uh, authoritarian. But people who have these expectations, these rules, these controls, and they care about the child, and they have communication with the child, and they're involved with the child, that's authoritative. And that of the four choices here is the only good kind of parenting, according to most research outcomes. All right, number six. At her preschool, Parker plays alongside the other children in the play kitchen area. Like the other children, she removes plates and cups from the cabinets and pretends that she is serving and eating food. However, Parker does not directly interact with the other children. Parker is demonstrating what kind of play. So she's there with the other kids, uh, they're, but they're not interacting with each other. The choices are solitary, cooperative, associative, or parallel. Well, the answer here is parallel. Um, and I'm going to bring out a big table. I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but this is from the book about our categories of play. Unoccupied, social, excuse me, unoccupied, solitary, onlooker, parallel, associative, uh, cooperative. And we're looking at that middle one, parallel. It is social because you're with other people and you want to be with them, but you're, you're not playing with them. You're just kind of playing next to them. All right, question number seven. Solène decides to sit in the corner of her daycare facility and brush a doll's hair. As other children gather in the play kitchen area, Solène remains in the corner with her doll. And what type of play is Solène engaging? So, sort of a similar situation, but she's still sort of by herself. All right, solitary, unoccupied, onlooker, or parallel play? In this case, it's solitary. She's by herself. She's not, she's not interacting. She's not functionally oriented towards anybody. She's just by herself. And that gets us back to the same table here. You see solitary. Play with toys. but It's the second row here. Play with toys by themselves, independently of others. They don't appear to be influenced by others around them. They make no effort to approach them. It's solitary. All right, number eight. What is the evidence that there is a genetic link to aggression? Okay. Here's our choices. Drugs used to treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder typically also reduce aggressive behavior in children. Okay, maybe so. Children who have high levels of testosterone tend to have lower self-esteem and commit more crimes than adults. Okay, that's choice B. C. Adoption studies show that the biological children of criminals commit more crimes than the biological children of non-criminals. Or D, there is a greater agreement rate for criminal behavior between identical twins than fraternal twins. Well, you know, truthfully, I, I, all of these things, things, all of these answers, these statements are potentially correct without necessarily supporting this uh, hypothesized link. Um, it, most of them are irrelevant because they can't say that it's because of the genetics. Um, on the other hand, the one that comes closest to this is D. There's a greater agreement rate for criminal behavior between identical twins and fraternal twins. That is normally taken as an indication of there being some kind of genetic or biological trait. Uh, bio there's a lot more biological influences than just genes. Genes is just one of them. Um, and, you know, for instance, you might get a chart that looks like this where you you're charting relatedness on the bottom, where MZ is monozygotic or identical twins, DZ is dizygotic or fraternal twins, then you have siblings, then you have half-siblings who and unrelated, in terms of the percentage of uh, the genetics that they uh, share. And you look at how strong the observed correlation is in the behaviors. And the idea is that if you see a larger correlation for people who are more genetically related, then that is evidence that is consistent with the idea of a genetic cause. It doesn't prove it, but it is consistent with it. All right, number nine. What is a critique of the evolutionary psych excuse me, what is a critique of the evolutionary perspective of gender typing? Well, okay. Among humans, biology is not destiny. Biological differences between men and women are small. Success has replaced survival as a new evolutionary pressure, and today's world favors cognition, not physical strength. Okay. Um now, this is the one that's going to get you credit. A, among humans, biology is not destiny. I, I'm going to tell you, yeah, I personally don't see this as the answer. I mean, it's the one that gets credit, but 
nobody in evolutionary psychology would say that biology is always going to be the only sole determinant. That's just ridiculous. What they're saying is it plays a role. It is a factor, one among many. And so, of course, it's not destiny. Nobody says that it is. And I hate that that's the answer here. Also, the idea that the biological differences between men and women are small, a lot of times they are. It doesn't mean it's not genetic or it's not evolutionary. It can still can be. That, that's neither here nor there. And then C and D are just, you know, success is replaced survival as a new evolutionary pressure. I think that's just bunk. That's just not true. And D, today's world favors cognition, not physical strength. And, you know, well, certain jobs favor cognition. A lot of them do still favor uh, physical strength. And, uh, you know, my take on that one, by the way, is good old Rosie the Riveter here. We can do it. She is showing herself to be not totally determined by genetic pressures, although you could argue that because of the uh, change of the labor relations during World War I, that was a change in evolutionary pressure. Could have explained it as much as anything, but I'm not going to go into that one. Um, question 10. Children with self-concepts that are inconsistent with the prominent gender schema of their culture are likely to develop what? Well, could it be anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder or depression or low self-esteem? You know, our Rosie the Riveter from a previous one could be a, a, an example of this, except it was different. Anyhow, well, the answer here is low self-esteem. And what we have... By the way, so I'm going to put this is a wonderful thing. A guy, Tony Porter, uh, who has this uh, organization, A Call to Men. I love this quote. If it would destroy a 12 year old boy to be called a girl, what are we then? What are we then teaching him about girls? It's a great thing about respect. Uh, his big thing is about ending violence towards women. And I'll just finish uh, the second quiz for chapter four with that one. Thanks for being here.